Good evening. Uh, who's been to one of these uh, community meetings before? Okay, who's here for the first time? Okay, so we got an interesting mix. Uh, what we have done in the past is I've done kind of a long presentation about what's going on in the city. And then uh, at the end, I stay and answer every single question for as long as they uh, come on. And so we've done one this year in each of the seven districts. So I've already done the overview. And we said, what can we do differently this time? Because we have people who sat through a district meeting and want to hear something else. And so what we're going to do tonight is talk about long-term plans for neighborhoods. All right. And I'm going to do a little bit of the beginning. And then I'm going to turn it over to Maurice Cox, our planning director, who's working very deeply on it. And we're going to give you a chance to hear at length from the person who's driving the neighborhood revitalization strategy. So let's start. Uh, on the things that you already know. When, when I got in here two and a half years ago, of course, uh, you started with the fact blight was overwhelming, uh, grass wasn't being cut, lights weren't on, et cetera. We had to do some things in the first couple of years just to deal with the worst of it, to now be in a position to say, let's actually plan what these neighborhoods are going to look like. And so um, I ran on a campaign pledge that said every neighborhood uh, has a future. And tonight, we're going to start talking about what does that future look like uh, for the different neighborhoods. So uh, you know what we're doing on demolition. Uh, we've been taking down these houses at a rate uh, that hasn't been done before. A couple weeks ago, uh, we took down our 10,000th abandoned house. Uh, so was a, a great day of celebration in that neighborhood. The neighbors across the street said they've been looking at that house for about eight years. And so uh, it came down to a great deal of cheers. So in the last two and a half years, we've taken down 10,233 houses. And you can see all of them on our website because we now track them. If you go to DetroitMI.gov, the blue dots are the ones that came down. The yellow dots are the ones that are scheduled. You can actually go to your neighborhood or a neighborhood that you care about and you can see the house, who the contractor was, how much it cost to take down. Or if it's in a yellow dot, you can see when it's scheduled to come down. Uh, so this is something we've had in the last couple of months because we want people to know uh, what's going to be happening in their uh, community. And we had a problem about a year and a half ago with the prices. This year, the average price is down to $12,500. It took us a while to get the hang of this. Uh, but we feel like we're doing pretty well. And when you get an idea of what we're dealing with, nobody else in America has dealt with anything like this magnitude. The second biggest demolition program in the United States is going on in Ohio. And they demolish less than 1,000 houses a year. We're going to do 5,000 this year just in the city of Detroit. All right. so, so we've made some mistakes in the process, but we've done it because we're operating at a speed and a rate that nobody's ever seen. And you can see the way that we have ramped up. So that's good. You get rid of the burned out houses and the blight. Uh, but of course, that doesn't rebuild the neighborhood. That's just the starting point, right? So then what do we do? Uh, how many of you have been on our website, buildingdetroit.org? Right, so you know what we're doing. We're auctioning three houses every single day. We have got a lot of structurally sound, beautiful houses that are vacant in this city. And so what we found is if you go on a block and there's four vacant houses on the block and two of them are burned out and two of them are solid, if you knock down the two burned out houses, you can get people to move into the other two houses and fix them up. And so every day, nine in the morning, we start the auction, five at night it ends, uh, we now have 2,000 houses that were vacant two years ago that are occupied today either from the auctions or from our lawsuits. 2,000 houses, 2,000 families are now in houses in neighborhoods where they were empty. And I'll show you just a few of the pictures. Those of you who have been here have seen these before. But this house on Rosa Parks that looked like that about a year ago now looks like that. And that house on Collingwood looked like that now looks like that. That house on Chicago 
Now it looks like that. That's what we've done 2,000 times. We've taken houses that people thought couldn't be saved, and we've gotten families to move in, and we've gotten them fixed up. And we're going to continue to do that because we have some beautiful housing stock in this city. So, all right, we're taking down the burned out houses. We're moving as fast as we can uh, on the vacant houses. Uh, and then when you knock down all these houses, we have a whole lot of side lots. And in this city, you know what that's mean. Weeds grow, grass grows, they're there forever. We said, let's make it simple. If you live next door to a vacant lot and we own it, you can come in and buy it for 100 bucks. And we started holding these side lot sales. These are all folks who came out to side lot sales. Uh, they walk in, they give us $100, they walk out with a deed. 4,800 people now have, and these are the houses, 4,800 homeowners now have the lot next door where they're planting a garden, they're putting in a swing set. Uh, they've made their neighborhood and their lot a little bit more valuable. So those are the steps we've taken so far. Now the question is, what do we do next? Uh, and if you look at what we've done so far, to me a big measure is what's happened to the property values. And so this comes off the Michigan Real Estate Database. This is the public database on sales prices from two years ago to this year. Every area in dark green has increased in sales prices more than 25% in the last two years. That's what's happened in our property values. Those in light green have gone up, but less than 25%. Those in red have actually gone down the last two years, and the white areas means we had fewer than five sales. They're by and large uh, uh, not a lot there to sell or their apartments, and these, these are only counting single family homes. So did you ever think you'd see the day that that much of Detroit would see the property values go up 25% in two years? We're headed in the right way. But of course, the property values were so depressed that 25% is only a start, right? I mean, we, we had a lot of places lost half of their uh, value in the 2008-2009 reception. So we have to ask the question this. What do we do next? Those are the things we've done, demolition, auctions, selling the side lots. What do we do next? And how do we bring our, our neighbors back? And how do we get more people who want to be here? And so this is the question that we're asking every day. And for as long as I can remember, Detroit has been managing the climb, right? We had a million eight living in this city, and now we have 700,000. So we've been managing decline for 50 years. And so the planning department, all the department just said, okay, let's just slow how fast we're declining. We said, what if instead we take a look at what we have and figure out how to build? Well, that means that a lot of neighbors in the city, we got a bunch of vacant lots. Are we just going to leave them there? They say, well, oh, I wish somebody would build a new house on the vacant lot next to me. Well, here's the truth. The truth is that in most neighborhoods, it would cost 100000 to build that new house, and the day it's done, it could probably wouldn't sell for more than 50000 So nobody's coming to Detroit to build houses on the vacant lots. And if you do want to build, we got so many solid vacant houses you can rehab, it's much better to do that than to build from scratch. So we know, at least for now, people aren't going to come into these neighborhoods and build new houses on the vacant lots. So the question is, could we use that vacant land in a way that beautifies the neighborhood, that it's not a nuisance to have uh, these lots? And so. Uh, we have a new planning director, Maurice Cox, who you're going to hear from in a minute. And here's what he has done. We've been working with the district managers, who, of course, have worked out very well with a lot of the neighborhoods, to say, OK, where are the strongest neighborhood groups, the ones that want to partner, get engaged, the associations are really strong with our planning folks. And we don't want to plan the neighborhoods out of the offices downtown. That's not how we're going to do this. We want to go into the neighborhoods, work with the people there, spend time there, and design the recovery of these neighborhoods together because nobody knows what's best for the neighborhood and the people who live there. And so Maurice Cox and his team have gone to the seven districts, and we got seven neighborhood associations who came forward, one in each district, and said, we want to go first. We want to try this idea of planning our, our neighborhood in partnership with the city. 
And so in District 1, the Grand Mont Rosedale area came forward. In District 2, Fitzgerald, and it's actually really the whole Livernois McNichols area uh, from Mary Grove to UAD Mercy. Those neighborhood groups came forward and said, we want to go next. Uh, just north of Hamtramck was now starting to become Bangletown. That group came forward and said, Let's, we want to go first up here. District 4 on the far east side, Jefferson Chalmers, very strong association. Uh, on, the, on District 5, West Village is coming back very well. Really strong group. District 6, uh, the, the area along Vernon near Clark Park has a great uh, neighborhood association. In District 7, uh, Russell Woods uh, is coming back amazingly fast. And so those neighborhood groups said, we want to be a part of showing that the city and the neighborhoods can plan these new neighborhoods together. And we're going to do this, and then next year, as the year goes on, we're going to pick seven more neighborhoods. And so if your neighborhood's not up here, we'd like you to kind of participate in what's going on. And if your neighborhood association is strong, then we'll go to the next neighborhood. And so what we have done is this. The planning department of the city of Detroit for the last 20 years basically had one job. The planning department of Detroit ran demolitions. That's what they did. There wasn't any planning going on in the city. Basically, they just kind of shrugged their shoulders and said, we're going to keep losing population. We did something different. We said, we are going to build a world-class planning department. Because in Detroit, we've got opportunities to grow this city. I believe the city has a great future. And so we went and recruited nationally. Uh, and our planning director, Maurice Cox, who here has met Maurice? Okay, the rest of you are about to. Uh, and so he was what we wanted. He started his planning career as a planner in Italy. And then in Charlottesville, Virginia, driving their rebirth. Then he was down in New Orleans as a professor of planning and working with the people in New Orleans following uh, the flooding, rebuilding their city. He's one of the most prominent planning directors in America. And we went out and recruited him. And we said, here's an opportunity to do something that will last a long time. He has recruited a staff of 25 planners. This is the great thing of coming out of bankruptcy, is we got rid of that debt. We're actually able to hire people to do things that real cities can do. He's put together some of the finest planning staff from the city of Detroit and from cities around the country. And just like we have district managers in your districts working with you on your problems in the neighborhood on Blight, He's got planning directors assigned to the different areas of the city so they can get to know your area well. And what we're going to do tonight is show you for the first time how we're thinking about replanning neighborhoods. And Maurice has started very uh, intensely in the Livernois McNichols area. And instead of me talking tonight, uh, and I'll be here at the end, and I'm going to answer every single question as I always do, but I want you to hear... Uh, from our planning director, Maurice Cox, in the way he's thinking about these neighbors. And then we want to hear from you. How does this approach sound? What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? Uh, what should we be doing differently? And so with that, uh, please give a big hand to our planning director, Maurice Cox. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Duggan. Um, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful uh, to share the stage with Mayor Duggan and uh, remember uh, a lot of the reasons why I took this job uh, 14 months ago. Um, Mayor Duggan um, said that he wanted a, a champion, a champion of neighborhoods. And that really did it for me because so much of the story nationally is about the comeback of downtown. And uh, that's true. The, the heart of any city is its downtown. But the soul of a city resides in its neighborhoods. And so I was thrilled to accept that challenge. Um, we started by trying to get a handle on how do you organize a city this vast? How do you deliver services? How do you engage residents where they are? And we decided to bring uh, the city into three different regions. Um, the west region, that includes districts one, two, and seven, uh, the central region, which is five and six, and then the east, which is uh, districts three and four. And for each of those districts, we've built um, 
cross-disciplinary teams. That means all of the professional disciplines we need to serve residents where they are. And I'm going to show off uh, a few of these extraordinary people who've come um, uh, to, to work on these regions. Um, Dave Walker leads a team that is both planning and development, but also the jobs and economy team and housing and redevelopment. And these folks work exclusively in that region uh, to revitalize neighborhoods there. We set up the same structure for the east side, uh, led by Esther Yang, who is the design director there. Again, a cross-disciplinary team of um, three different departments working on the east side every day. Uh, and then the central region, uh, which is the biggest region, uh, led by Steve Lewis, who's the design director there, again with colleagues in both the jobs and economy team and uh, housing and redevelopment. So this is how we're going to get it done. We've broken the city down into regions that we think we can revitalize. So the question that is posed is really, what are the de uniquely Detroit advantages that we can leverage for the revitalization? And how can we do that in an inclusive way um, that really sets out a new model for how American cities regenerate? We think we've got a few answers, uh, and it can be described in about 20 minutes, uh, and it's called the 20 minute neighborhood. And I think you'll quickly understand what I mean by that. Imagine a street like this in your neighborhood. People on the sidewalks, sidewalk cafes, people on bike lanes, very little traffic, somebody getting uh, lettuce <laughs> from the median. Uh, you can begin to see um, a, a, a dynamic street life. Uh, this is what we are going to try to do in Detroit neighborhoods. And what you're seeing there are, is the creation of a place that's convenient, that's safe, and that is pedestrian oriented. You can go from your front door by walking or bike and within 20 minutes get to the services that you need uh, day in and day out. And uh, the important thing about this is to do this without heavily relying on a car. Hello, <laughs> uh, the Motor City. <laughs> we would like to get to a place where it is more pleasurable to walk than to drive in this city. And there are components of that. We'll talk a little bit about the foundation, but there are some things in some of our neighborhoods that are missing that we need to support this kind of walkable environment. Um, it's sometimes called the missing middle. That means we have a lot of single family we have some high rises in everything in the middle that provides people with housing choices are generally missing. So that's row houses, townhouses, quadruplexes, courtyards, medium density housing. We have to build that density in the right place. We need to be able to access fresh produce and groceries within a 20 minute walk from our home. And that means that we're going to have to support and build up those existing grocery stores and also add national chain grocery stores as well so that people really have a variety of choices. Um, then, of course, uh, our schools and public facilities. Um, neighborhood schools, public places like libraries that are integrated into the neighborhood. Fortunately, the structure of that is already in place and then access to neighborhood parks. Uh, these are places that are easily accessible to our children, to families, for recreational activities within their neighborhood. Additionally, um, there are the regional parks, right? Um, parks like Belle Isle or the East Riverfront. Everyone should be able to get to one of those larger regional parks uh, from their neighborhoods in Detroit. And then the foundation for all of this is diversifying our transit, um, getting our buses um, to the places where people want to go, um, introducing new forms of transportation like bus rapid transit and the Q line rail. And the beauty of this is if you have a, a wonderful network of sidewalks, you can support 
a variety of transit options. So um, that's what a 20-minute neighborhood has. Um, and the good news is that Detroit has al always had 20-minute neighborhoods. There's a grand, grand tradition of neighborhood building in Detroit, and much of that infrastructure is still in place. So whether it's transit, a streetcar, or wide sidewalks, or a variety of houses, this is a part of Detroit's tradition of making neighborhoods. But also uh, transit and mixed use were always a part of the tradition of building Detroit neighborhoods. So you can see from this images, the bakery, the, the market, the shoe, uh, shoe store, it was all there within walkable distance from residential, and the transit was there. So we're kind of going back to the future, uh, but we also are accepting some of the opportunities that uh, this new form that we have, all of this land that we have. So out of all of the places to start, I uh, told the mayor we wanted to try it first uh, in the Livinois McNichol corridor. I wanted to get as far from downtown as possible <laughs> and show people that we can revitalize neighborhoods even south of Eight Mile. Um, so we looked at uh, this area um, to test a couple of ideas, uh, actually six ideas that we think uh, can revive a neighborhood. Single family housing is, is an anchor. This is a street in the Fitzgerald neighborhood. It's a area just north of Puritan, south of Six Mile from University of Detroit to Mary Grove. Uh, there are hundreds of families who still live here, and they have a wonderful housing stock. So we're going to start by trying to take this idea of these areas that are clustered in the neighborhood where there's strong um, ownership and rental uh, families that live there, but we're going to also try to deal with all the blue that you see uh, on the map. That, um, those areas that are vacant or there's a, um, a vacant lot or a vacant home on them. And so what we've tried to do is inventory all of the vacancy in the neighborhood. It's about 30%, about 400 lots out of the 1,200 lots in this quarter square mile. And trying to imagine what could we do to um, animate to make that neighborhood whole again? Well, the first thing is we could take the idea of the auction where homes are, uh, are renovated, and we can try to do not one at a time, but 70, 80 at a time. And how we can do that is through the assistance of resources that used to go for um, apartment buildings actually being able to be applied to single family homes. So we can assure that as this neighborhood evolves, there will be affordability in this neighborhood for those who are already here and those who continue to need affordable housing. And we're talking about holding on for 30, maybe 40 years to assure affordability. Um, the other thing is addressing this greenway, this neighborhood open space. So we're going to go in, and the area where we have the largest cluster of, of, of vacant land, we're going to create a little central park in the neighborhood uh, and connect that by a greenway that connects UDM to Mary Grove and then loops right back around so people will be able to get their exercise and get um, to the main streets by bike or walking. And so what you're seeing here is what that might look like. You string all of these vacant lots together, and you make a pedestrian and bicycle way that um, really gives people you know, a quiet place in their neighborhood. Um, so this image of people just walking um, to reflect and have quiet time, uh, as well as being able to get on a bike and stroll without having to navigate cars. So this uh, will be built in the, the first part of this infrastructure will be built in this year. The other is uh, the vacant lots. So this is the typical vacant lot. You plant uh, grass seed and you know what I say is you set up a mowing regime in perpetuity forever. Is there another way to do this? Could we 
um, do a low maintenance landscape that adds beauty to the neighborhood. Uh, so that house would be renovated for affordable. And then that lot next door will be a place where flowering meadows, um, something that adds beauty to the neighborhood uh, is added. Uh, so about half of the lots might have this treatment. And it's all behind a fence. So clues that people care for these properties are everywhere. Um, and then the other half of those lots could be used for productive uses. We believe that we can seed uh, neighborhood businesses that are based on land side by side with homes. And that means you might have uh, someone growing crops. You might have someone who has a, a flower, a cut flower business. Um, you may have orchards. So there is a way to bring the entrepreneurial spirit that Detroit has and bring it into the neighborhoods to revive, um, revive those neighbors, neighborhoods. And uh, the part I love about this is it's a workforce program as well. Who are the folks that are maintaining those landscapes? Who are the folks who are planting those landscapes? Those are Detroiters. And we partnered with the Greening of Detroit to launch the first uh, Detroit Conservation Corps that um, these are green collar jobs, these are living wage jobs, and these are folks in District 2 who are already on the ground preparing tens and tens of acres for these landscapes. So that is the relationship with the single family and uh, vacant land. But strong residential, re residential neighborhoods need, need strong main streets. And we believe that uh, Livinois um, has the foundation of what can be an extraordinary main street. This has happened uh, in other places of uh, Detroit. Um, some of you may recognize this from a, a few years ago. This is Agnes Street. This is what Agnes Street looked like a few years ago. And this is what it looks like today. In just a few years, getting shops, uh, restoring storefronts, uh, creating a street life. Uh, and this we call placemaking, or in the context of Detroit, placekeeping. We're trying to keep places that are already there uh, and have a way of enhancing the public space, the experience of walking, um, and beginning to share the road uh, with other modes of transportation, whether it be uh, buses or um, bicycle, uh, protected bicycle paths. Uh, this, uh, if you're on Livinois this weekend, you will see a demonstration, a pilot that we're running for about four blocks. We're going to um, put in bike lanes uh, and uh, reduce the speed of cars on the street and try to create a pedestrian um, place. Um, and then there are existing businesses and facades that could use a little tender loving care and coming up with programs for grants to improve facades of these main streets. And of course, where we have these beautiful historic um, apartment buildings, to restore them first uh, and use this as a way to get um, a range of housing options uh, within our neighborhoods. And then um, invite new, new building, um, mixed use buildings, um, retail on the ground floor, and, and housing uh, above. And there are places on these main streets that could receive this kind of density and diversify our main streets. And of course, uh, one of the real advantages we have um, are the cultural um, histories of these neighborhoods, each different one from the other. And could we use that to begin to brand them as very, very special places that drive people to want to stay? Um, small businesses, Main Streets, the foundation of Main Streets are small businesses, locally owned, uh, like Kozu's on um, Livinois, um, that was the recipient of a Motor City match. Um, but there's a new generation of Motor City entrepreneurs. Um, this uh, young lady who wanted to open up the coffee shop in the neighborhood and won the Motor City match. Uh, and so by the end of summer, beginning of fall, um, Livinori McNichols will have a cafe. 
a part of that 20 minute vision of neighborhoods. And then there are other um, neighborhood serving retail that's coming, slides uh, at Hunter's Supper Club and so on. This is the beginning of their um, renewed Main Street. Also uh, on Livinois, there are specific um, sites. This is the Comerica site that's going to be uh, a mixed use building. Higher density begins to have shops and uh, residential above. So um, the question is, can we build more? Can we identify more neighborhoods um, where we can begin um, to revitalize them with this strategy? Um, I think we can. And the mayor has already talked about how neighborhoods have begun to respond by working and reaching out to their district managers to say that they are up to the challenge. And I think of these as principles that are fundamentally democratic. We cannot plan neighborhoods without the folks who are there. And so the effort of this strategy is to mobilize people who are up to the challenge. We're going to share that work with you. We're going to give it right back to you so that we can interpret some of your aspirations for your neighborhood. And then um, problem solve, I like to say, according to that community's collective values. That's the strategy. So we think of it as um, a way of designing with people. Uh, these are visionary ideas, but the voices of those who live there are embedded in them. And we, uh, this South African slogan, nothing about us without us is for us, I try to live by that when I go and plan with our teams. So these are the neighborhoods that you will hear uh, about next. We've been working in partnership with Invest Detroit and others to identify the, the next ones. We first have to implement the Livinois McNichol st uh, strategy, so you will be hearing a lot about it uh, from your neighbors and in the press. But we've also decided um, that the work that's been done to prepare for us in West Village and in Southwest um, Detroit around Clark Park um, will be the next neighborhoods that we attempt this 20-minute uh, neighborhood strategy. But it's been interesting uh, to follow this because there are other neighborhoods that have organized and have come to us that were not on our radar, and now they are. So we will be working with the Russell Woods neighborhood because they organize through the Department of Neighborhoods, through their block captains, and now they too are a priority for our next year. Um, over the course of 2017, we intend to strategize to work with residents in every single council district to explore what it means to revitalize these neighborhoods, what it means to engage you in their comeback. Uh, so over the course of uh, 2017, and then quite frankly, we think this is just the beginning. And so, so how does this sound? So this is the way that we're thinking uh, about the world. We're going to bring people back. As I was going through and shaking hands and, and talking to folks before we started. I talked to three different people who told me they moved back to Detroit in the last year. And this is a story I'm hearing more and more. Right? I came from Southfield. I came from Troy. And here's the way we're thinking about this. We're not going to compete with the suburbs by being like them. All right. If we build neighborhoods with with large homes on cul-de-sacs and say, come on here. Well, heck, you can already get that in Farmington. And you don't have a lot of the challenges in Farmington that you have here. And so my challenge to Maurice Cox is how do you build something that's authentic to Detroit? And when you think about it, uh, you know, I, I spent a good part of my life in the suburbs. Here's what life is like in the suburbs. And it was designed this way. You're in these large lot uh, separated neighborhoods. If you need, you want to get a cup of coffee on a Saturday, you get in your car, right? Drive up to the strip mall. You want to get a gallon of milk? What do you do? You get in your car. You drive up to the strip mall. You got to get dog food for the dog? You get in the car. You drive, in the, your whole world in the suburbs is you go from your house 
to your car. And having lived in both the suburbs and the city, I can tell you there is one major difference. People who move back know this. People in Detroit neighborhoods know each other, right? They do. You're much more connected. You're in the neighborhoods. And because Detroit was built earlier, we've got commercial districts near our neighborhoods. And so the neighborhoods that we're filling in, if we fill the commercial districts in, can we get to the point where we can, neighborhood by neighborhood, create these kinds of destinations that you can walk to on a Saturday, that you can bike to, and with what we're doing uh, with the, the inner circle bike lane around the city, we're going to get to the point where not too far from now, you could live at McNichols uh, in Livernois, and on a Saturday in 20 or 25 minutes, ride a bike through a protected bike lane all the way down to the riverfront. Uh, and now we make it accessible to everybody. That's what Maurice is trying to do. And uh, how many meetings have you had in the Fitzgerald neighborhood now? So a dozen meetings I was, it was interesting because he was telling me this and I like to drive the neighborhoods on weekends and I was on Saturday, I was driving down one of the streets and somebody saw me and flagged me down. So I, I got out to talk to him and he told me where the Greenway was going to go through the Fitzgerald neighborhood and he had been part of planning the location. So when your neighbors are saying, Here's what we're doing now. Do all the neighbors agree anywhere in the city? Oh, there's going to be some back and forth, but that's healthy. There's nothing uh, wrong with that, but that's the road we're going to start down. Uh, thank you all very much.